وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام يوم الدين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أعظم الله وجورنا ووجوركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to congregate yet again in the remembrance of our most beloved Imam Hussein and through him to seek inspiration on how to lead a meaningful life and how to attain the purpose of our humanly existence on the face of this earth looking at his blessed divine example. The series of talks for this year are discovering our entitled Discovering God. We will be looking at the nature of our yearning to find meaning, to find purpose. And we will be seeing that that purpose and that meaning is entailed in arrival at God or in the embracing of God or the emergence of God from within our confines in our human context. In that, we will talk briefly about the nature of God and the whole process of devotion and how devotion and devotional practices within Islam, although not restricted to Islam, devotional practices of every faith, but we will be talking about the prominent devotional practices of Islam, how they assist us in the arrival at the state of godliness. With that being said, we look at ourselves in a very fundamental condition that is there within us as human beings and indeed within existence at large. There is this deep-seated yearning to know who I am. Who am I? Even after worshipping God for 70 years, serving humanity, there is this question that prods away at the depths of our heart and we are brought face to face with this particular unknown. Who am I? What is it all about? What is going on? Surely there should be something far more deeper than this. Surely there must be some, some, some substantive meaning. Surely there must be some depth to my existence. Surely there must be a real sense of life. What is happening? Who am I? That is a fundamental question at the soul of every human being. It is as if the Spirit of God that is blown within the souls or within the chest of the children of Adam is yearning itself. If looked at carefully, every aspect of existence is dynamic. It's in motion. It wants to find itself. It wants to know itself. Can you not see this beautiful motion? There is no arrest to this motion within existence. Everything is fueled by this question, who am I? Everything wants to reveal itself. And in the process of revelation, we see this wonderful evolution. Even without arriving at that understanding of who I am, we are growing and evolving as a human society. Intellectually, we have now cast our reins upon the lofty heavens and we have dived within the deep oceans, looking, searching, exploring. We inevitably are in search, and in that process we are evolving. But that fundamental question still prods away deep within us, who am I? When we look at existence in its entirety, now we are beginning to see that, of course, this existence is conscious to itself. It is alive to itself the way in which it is functioning, the dynamism, the meticulous balance, the way everything is arranged. It is next to impossible that this could have come about in randomness. There is infinite possibility of it going wrong and infinitely it's going right. At every point there are infinite possibilities of things going wrong. At every point it is going right. It is as if everything has a mind of its own. The whole being somehow is a living being. 
Even the atheistic thinkers now are arriving at this point that every atom has consciousness and a mind of its own. Everything is functioning in a way that is unexplainable. The Quran says, In min shayin illa yusabbihu bihamdi rabbi. There is nothing but that it sings the eulogy and the praise of its Lord. But you understand not. And then the Quran exclaims, He is the first, he is the last, he is the apparent, he is the hidden. The Quran paints this picture of God as if it is nothing but the display of the divine. Your eyes are unable to see, but within you there is something that is wanting to recognize this truth. Take the plunge, go for it, ask the question, what is going on? Who am I? For until and unless you ask the question, the journey in the realist sense does not commence. A human being is being dragged to his God. Allah says, you will meet me on the day of Qiyamah, whether you like it or not. He's elusive, he's not to be found. You go to the furthest parts of the galaxy, there is no God. In fact, you go to Sidratul Muntaha, you will not find God. He says, there is nothing like him. No matter where you travel, no matter how much you exercise your minds, you will not find him. Then why is there this yearning, this burning desire to find out who I am and who he is? We look at Quran once again. The Quran gives a phenomenal description. Allah nurus samawati wal ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. We look at it again. And Allah says, Allah waliyu ladina amanu yukhrijuhum mina dhulumati ilan nur. Allah is the saintly friend of those who bring faith in him, i.e. those who direct themselves to him. He purges them of darkness and brings them into a state of enlightenment. What the verses of the Quran are saying is that our motion is towards the embracing of all light and the inner light is yearning the light of all lights. But I am in a state of darkness and I need to give myself to light in its entirety. Again, we read in the Quran, the verses of the Quran say, on that day of Qiyamah, the people who have arrived at a state of felicity, you will see their light shine from their faces and from their hands. In another place it says, that these people will turn to God and plead to God and say, Oh Allah, akmil lana nurana. O oh Allah, complete for us our light. From the Quranic perspective, it seems that for us to find answer to that primordial question and to that yearning, prodding and query that is inside us is for us to arrive in the state of light, not enlightenment, but to become light itself. To become light itself, therefore, means to allow God to prevail. How beautiful is the way it's been explained that, O oh soul, you are the awakening of the divine in that limitation of your humanity. If only you knew who you are and what you are. Bring to mind Rumi's words. He says, O oh man, if indeed you understood your own rank, if only you knew what you were. That brilliant sun that you admire with such wonder and amazement. The light that will shine through you is so brilliant in its luminosity that the brilliant sun within the depth of the sky shall disappear shying away from the brilliance of your light. This is how grand you are. So it seems finding God is not a question of finding God in a place, nor mentally, 
but it is a question of allowing God to prevail to give ourselves over to him let the author himself display his own self unrestrictedly through the human individual so we ask well, who is God and what is God how phenomenal is the being of God at once he says Lisa Kamisli Hishe there is nothing like him Lam yakullahu kufu wa ahad there is no equal to him the blessed prophet says O oh Lord zidni tahayyuran increase me in my bewilderment for the more I know you the more baffled I stand before you for the more I know you the greater is the mystery that enshrouds you Ali salamullah alay exclaims there is no attribute that can be assigned to him there is no description that can contain him how can you ever know him when that level of God dawns upon the mind and the heart the majesty of God is so brilliant that when the heart gets a glimpse of his majesty it begins to tremble in awe and in terror it sees the nothingness of its own self it sees unworthiness of its own self and a state of alienation from God because he's so majestic so brilliant so unknowable the Imam said La ya'lam kayfa huwa illa hu. no one knows how he is save he himself Imam Ali in one place says that there are proximate angels who are committed to the devotion of God they are so absorbed and immersed in the devotion of God that they are unaware that Adam has been created or something like the earth exists the radiance of the divine overpowers their souls and their hearts they are content at worshiping God the Imam says if God were to impart a single ray of his beauty upon the hearts and the souls of these angels as God is they would die in regret at not having known God at all and not having worshipped God at all such is the majesty of God and at the same time look at the description of God at once he is the transcendent the unknowable Kul huwa, say he he who the unknown he the unknowable he the creator of whatever you cannot fathom the creation in itself is ineffable you can't understand the creation even our physical existence in the fire dimensional scheme three spatial ext extensions and time and space even that the clusters of galaxies and whatever is there is so massive and so infinite and expanding at such a colossal rate that the human imagination cannot even imaginatively capture it then think about the creator of the multiverse and the multidimensional and think about the one who has created what we cannot know which is non-material and beyond non-material what the angels cannot even fathom at once he is the majestic one the unknowable one and at once he is the imminent the proximate Allah says huwa ma'akum ayna ma kuntum he is with you wherever you may be wa nahnu aqrab ilayhi min hablil warid and we are closer to him than his own jugular veins Allah comes between the man and his own soul and his own heart and his own thoughts this is how proximate he is fa inna ma tawallu fa samma wajhullah wherever you will turn you will see there the face of God he is immediately available and yet he is transcendent Imam Ali most brilliantly explains this particular notion of God he says he is with everything yet he touches nothing he is other than everything yet there is no space and there is no distance between him and anything how do you imagine such a God we are forced to conclude that he in himself cannot be known and as far as the creation is concerned and existence is concerned there is nothing but he the blessed one how wonderfully Imam Ali said I have never seen a thing but I have seen Allah beyond it below it before it and behind it how beautifully Hussein says oh Lord should I seek 
proof for your existence through your handiwork and your creation when I see your divine hand at work can your handiwork be more brilliant in manifesting you than you yourself who I see so clearly what vision did they get it is not true to say everything is God but it is definitely true to say nothing is other than God you will never say that the momentous waves are the ocean but you will always be able to say that the waves are nothing other than the ocean for the ocean is the unknown the waves are known yet they are nothing other than the what ocean wishes to reveal of itself that is the nature of God but what do we understand from the nature of God and what God are we drawn to God explains himself at the level of our existence he says he is Allah Rabbul Alameen he is Allah the Lord of the whole of this existence the name Allah is the mother of all names in terms of our context it is not the mother of all names as Allah is he is the nameless one he is he the one who cannot be named nor described he is beyond words and names he cannot be captured by anything but in terms of our existence he is Allah he is Rahman the word Allah signifies a status to which everything aspires <coughs> and a status that organizes everything in its own place so Allah is a description of he in the realm of our existence towards which everything turns for its own completion so whether we like it or not we are yearning God oh human <coughs> whether you agree or disagree to the existence of God you are being dragged to your God in a way that you shall surely meet with him no one can resist Allah and how is it possible to resist him when in every direction that you flee you will end with God how phenomenal is God Have come of age now surrender Ibrahim immediately changes his tone he no longer says my Lord he says now I surrender to the Lord of the worlds now he arrives at that beauty untarnished so the Lord of the worlds is Allah but within the world Allah governs every individual aspect of the world 
as the personal Lord of everything. Imam Sadiq said, the ant assumes its Lord to have two antennas. Every individual creation is vested with the light of the author. And every individual existence reflects the author within its own context. Isn't that phenomenal? The ant can never understand my God. I can never understand the God of the ant until I accomplish myself. I will never understand the God of the Blessed Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Just as Abu Dhar could not understand the God of Salman. Can you not see this? It's a personal, private journey to our own Lord the way we understand Him. At once He's the Lord of humanity, the Lord of the animal kingdom, the Lord of the plant kingdom, and everything displays its author in the most beautiful way it can. And the author addresses every one of its handiwork in its own context. Here we want to resolve a thing. We will say, how can the most beautiful God have an enemy? It does not befit God to have enemy. Can you not see this? Has anybody asked this question? It must be springing up in the minds from time to time. How can God be so vengeful, so wrathful, so angry? Does it come to mind or not? It does, doesn't it? But God, you are God. This is the pettiness of my existence that I want revenge. That I say, how dare you say this? I will fling you in the fire pits of hell. This is me, not you, O oh God. Has anybody wondered why God says these things? Because he operates with us at our level. He has authored us and the author reflects our nature through his nature. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing the way God is. He has a friend. He has enemies. He is merciful. He is vengeful. He gives. He withholds. <coughs> In our context, God is expressing our nature. But in expressing our nature, he is regulating it as well. Think about it. As human beings, when we threaten, what is that threat based on? On the want of greater good. Can you not see that? The impelling force is love and goodness and productivity. In the way as a method comes the threat. When a father and a parent and a teacher, they penalize and ground their children, are they doing it through hatred? Or are they doing it as a means of love? You will see that these qualities that we say are less than befitting for God, it is they are not God's qualities, they are our qualities that God is reflecting in a language that we understand. Is that coming through? We yearn women. So he says you've got women in paradise. We yearn rivers. There are rivers in paradise. We yearn honey and wine. They're all in paradise. Oh man, you are worth more than women and wine and rivers of honey and trees. How cheaply you have sold yourself. You are the reflection of the author himself. If the author within an instance can create the lofty paradise. Imagine how beautiful the author himself must be. When you can have the author himself and you can author infinitely, what cause do you have with the lofty seven paradises? All of it comes to naught when you taste the pleasure of his love. So here Molana Rumi explains, that you will see God's attributes as the attributes of clemency and harshness, mercy and wrath, majesty and love. But you will always find that in dealing with human beings, God's merciful attributes prevail. Yes, He wants justice to be done. Yet, He says, I can forgive whoever I want. Yes, he can take revenge. Yes, he says. Yet he says, 
My mercy envelops everything. So when we look at the Lord of humanity, we see the Lord of humanity as we are, so that we can relate to the Lord of humanity. Once we begin to relate to the Lord of humanity, there opens up another door of private, personal belonging to God. He says, I am so lofty, but I am so near, that if you call me, I will respond to you. If you ask me, I will give to you. If you trust me, I will be enough for you. If you forgive, I shall forgive you. If you feed others, I shall feed you. If you give shade to a homeless person, I shall give you shade. When we open up to him personally, privately, he opens another door for a personal, intimate belonging with himself. If we can understand this point, this personal, intimate belonging with God, then we arrive at that level of Rabbi, my Lord. Now the phenomenal thing here is, as Shams Tabrizi, when he met the scholars of fiqh, and they are saying that if you don't do wudu this way, it's not accepted, and your prayer is not accepted, and then you will stand in debt on the day of Qiyamah, and then you will go to hell. Think about it. If you don't do wudu properly, salah is not accepted. If you don't do salah properly, you have a debt. If you have a debt, you will be questioned on the day of Qiyamah. When you will be questioned on the day of Qiyamah, you will not be able to respond. With a debt on your head, you're going to hell. That was their reasoning in jurisprudence. Shams looked at them and said, you indeed worship a vengeful Lord and he will indeed burn you. Imagine. Your Lord is the way you are. Once the great Ibn Arabi was sitting somewhere and he said, your Lord lies beneath my feet. They threw stones at him and chased him away. Somebody said that Ibn Arabi cannot utter such loose words. So he went and dug at the place where Ibn Arabi sat. And he found a treasure trove filled with gold and gemstones. And he smiled. He said, yes, Ibn Arabi was saying they worship this. He who worships the God of paradise shall end up in paradise. He who worships the God of hell and becomes hellish himself goes to hell. He who worships the God of Hussein becomes Hussein. At that level of the worship of personal God, if we can understand that it is His beautiful light calling us to Him, and if we can understand that within the threat is love, that within anger is pleasure, then we begin to become like God. You will say, this is a grand intellectual, this is a phenomenal scholar. But when you look as a saint, obviously I'm not going to say like the one in front of you, <laughs> you will say, this is a godly creature. Beyond the scholar, beyond the leader, is godliness. When you look at the blessed prophets of God, they are filled with knowledge. They are courageous people. They are indeed charitable. You will not find it appropriate to attribute them with any one of these qualities. If you have to attribute them with one quality that explains who they are, you will come out with one statement. They are godly. And that godliness encapsulates the beauty of their being. Because they are radiating with God. So when we find that personal God, and in devotion, when we begin to give ourselves away to God, then God begins to prevail. So the question is not finding God. The question is not conceptualizing God. The question is one of allowing God to emerge from within our beings. And that is only possible 
when we prefer God above ourselves and give ourselves over to the author, that the author emerges himself. It was never a question of meeting with God in the way we understand. It was never a question of uniting with God. It was always a question of arrival at that state of realization of the already pre-existence of union with the beloved. The only way the wave will meet with the ocean is when the wave gives up trying to be itself. Once it relents, it calms down into the beauty of the unending ocean. And that is the meeting with the beloved, that we let ourselves go. And once we come to that Abrahamic position, then the Lord of the world claims himself, Ana rabbukum ala. not the pharaonic sentiment, but godly sentiment. The kingdom of the soul has been given over to God. As we commence the narration of Hussein Salamu Lali, I will point out that he radiates so brilliantly when the blade appears upon his thirsty neck. Serenity prevails upon him to an extent that it pacifies those around him. The raging daggers and the swords are brought to a halt. The swearing and insults directed to him fall silent. They observe his serenity and they observe his lips moving in the eulogy of Allah. And they say, by Allah, we have not seen one who is so deprived, so wounded, so thirsty, who has lost everything, whose heart bears uncountable pains. And yet, as he turns upon the dust, about to lose his life, he supplicates to God with such serenity that even our hearts are moved. That was the meeting point of God, or rather the emergence of the beauty of the divine through the being of Hussein. We come to the narration of Karbala. Muawiya dies, Imam Hussein witnesses nine years of his imamate under the reign of Muawiyah and six months. Muawiyah at his death leaves his will to Yazid. I have secured, he says, the oath of allegiance from one and all, save for three or four people. Hussein ibn Ali, Abdullah bin Umar and Abdullah bin Zubair. As far as Abdullah bin Zubair is concerned, find him at all costs and put him to death before he finds you. As for Abdullah bin Omar, treat him well and you will find him an ally. As for Hussein ibn Ali, if he comes out in revolt against you, then overpower him. But treat him well, for there is kinship between us. But Muawiyah realized that if Yazid were to put Imam Hussein to death, that would inevitably lead to such reprisals that would compromise their own kingdom. Muawiyah was quite sharp. Muawiyah Yazid, after the death of Muawiyah, dispatches a letter to his governor and his cousin, Walid bin Utbah bin Abi Sufyan, and he instructs, Muawiyah has died, I am the Khalifa, extract the oath of allegiance from Hussein. And if he doesn't give it, then overpower him. Imam Hussein is called within the palace at night. The Imam turns to Abbas and Akbar and the Hashimis and he says, I have been called to the palace of Walid, to the office of Walid. I fear for the worst. Accompany me. If you hear my voice being raised, 
hesitate not hesitate not come to my aid immediately Imam Hussein comes to Walid Walid says oh Muawiyah has died Imam Hussein pronounces the words of istirja inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun Yazid seeks your bay'ah Marwan was sitting with Walid Imam Hussein looked at Walid he said would you not rather i paid allegiance in the light of day amidst the congregation of people and walid said indeed return to your home marwan said walid if this man leaves right now he will not come in your control again behead him or take allegiance imam hussein raised his voice how dare you talk about killing me as his voice is raised Abbas pushes open the door the raging lion of Hussein walks in with his sword drawn Walid is startled and so is Marwan they step back but Akirin mentioned that Imam Hussein places his hand upon the chest of his lion and he says Abbas control your rage Imam Hussein returns the Bakiri often mentioned that Abbas is tearful and sobbing. He comes to Zainab. He looks at Zainab. He said, "Walid asked me to pay allegiance to Yazid." Zainab looks into the eyes of Hussein and says, "Hussein, so indeed the promise is going to come to pass." And then she hears Abbas she says oh hussein what has brought my brother to this state there was a death of threat upon me oh sister and this is why he sobs so uncontrollably imam hussein comes to the grave of the blessed prophet to bid him farewell he says oh grandfather i do not wish to part from your grave but i am left with no option these people will find me and put me to death at your grave and i do not wish for that as he cried he fell asleep and he saw his grandfather he said oh grandfather take me to you and where you are he said oh hussein you will be oppressed most brutally before you come to me prepare yourself oh hussein Umm Salama rushes to Hussein. She says, "Oh child, I hear you are setting off to Kufa. I beseech you, for the sake of God, do not go, for you shall not return." How so? He says, "Oh grandmother, your grandfather has given me some dust, and this is verified by Shia and Sunni historians. Oh, hadith. He has said, when this dust turns color and goes red, know that my son has been slain brutally." He said, "Oh, grandmother, I know this very well, but I have no option." Imam Hussein prepares for departure on the next night under the cloak of darkness. Somebody from Sham was there observing the scene. He said, "I saw Hussein sat in the courtyard, and the Hashemis stood around him. Suddenly there was a cry: 'O oh, sons of Hashem, lower your gazes!'" I saw a beautiful youth accompanying a woman draped in veils. He brought her to the carriage, kneeled, and she ascended. I asked, "Who was he?" I was told, "He is the apple of Hussein's eye, Akbar." And who was she? She was his mother. Once again there was a call O oh, Hashemis lower your gaze I saw a majestic man appear with him were two women he knelt and the two women ascended into their carriages I asked who was he I was told this is the moon of the Hashemis Abbas and who are they they were his sisters Zainab and Kulthum I will say, oh Abbas, you allow them 
to enter within the carriage on this day. If only you could have seen their state and their cries on the 11th of Muharram. Zainab's back is being whipped. She is being taken like captives and she is ordered to ascend upon a camel without a carriage or a saddle. As she looks towards the Euphrates and she cries out, Wa Abbasa, where are you on this day? to take me into my carriage. Allah la'anatu la'ala al-qawmi al-thalimeen wa sayya'alamu al-ladheena zhalamu wa yamun qalabi yanqalibun ilahi inna nasaluka bi haqqil Hussain wa jaddihi wa bi wa ummihi wa khi wa tisati al-ma'asumina min durriyatihi wa manihi Allahumma aghfir lana dunubana wa kaffir anna sayyatina wa tawaffana ma'ala barar Allahumma ajjil faraj imamina al-muntadar واجعلنا من انصاره واعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة Ten flew 
here I'm going to hopefully be discussing if Allah gives life and, and the opportunity the, the um, understanding of ilmul ghayb so now the prophet says I do not know ghayb and if I knew ghayb no misfortune would have fallen me but at the same time the prophet said these are the signs of the end of times yes and the prophet was the mouthpiece for the Quran Rome has been vanquished, but it will regain control in a few years' time. So this is the Prophet being inspired of the rape through the Quran. Then we find that the Prophet says, after me shall come these sort of people, after them this shall happen. So the Prophet was giving futuristic events as well. So now the question is of reconciliation. That what does it mean to know the rape and yet know the rape and deny knowing the rape? We need to reconcile. All of these things have not really been dealt with properly. Um, although I know you're not asking the question, I've just become mindful, so I better look <laughs> sorry. All of these things need to be reconciled. Yes? So for example, <clears throat> we've got the uh, hadith of the Mahdi, salamu when the Mahdi will come, Sufyan. So somebody might say, okay, the Shia sources, you know, Shias are concocting, but these are from Sunni sources. A lot of them, right? When the Mahdi comes, the Jal will come, this will happen, that will happen. The Prophet has said all of that. If that is not Ilmul Ghayb, then what is it? So now, Nostradamus has Ilmul Ghayb as well. He made many prophecies and predictions. Some people feel they've come true. Many of us see things in our dreams of future events and they happen. This is, so these things need to be qualified properly to reconcile between only Allah knowing the Ghayb, being able to know Ghayb through Allah, or there is an art of knowing things but we may not know them to occur with full confidence because God can change his destiny at any point. So now, if today we say that the weather tomorrow will be raining, and of course they always get it wrong, and I hope they get it wrong as well this time, but on many occasions they do get it right. This would be ilmul ghayb for a person living in a previous era in a century. They did not have this sophistication. For them, this would be in Mulgayb as well. Yes? Or forecasting the stock market, the rise in property prices, or the drop. These, for people who know 
economics, for example, who know the stock market, for them, these guesses are accurate. For us, they are ilmul ghaib. So ilmul ghaib needs to be qualified. What is the meaning of ilmul ghaib? Futuristic events, knowing what is in somebody's heart, seeing a dream, so on and so forth, being inspired through God. So with the Imams knowing that yes, X, Y, and Z is going to happen, or Imam Sadiq talking about the physical cosmos and beyond physical cosmos, which was not available to anybody at that point, because the theory of Aristotle uh, proposed a very different type of a universe. Imam Sadi came out with an outlandish idea, which today, through astrophysics, we are finding is accurate. That's also Ilmul Ghaib. Can you see that? So we need to qualify this thing very thoroughly, and we will do that next year. I do not find any conflict with us knowing certain future events, so long as we do not commit ourselves to saying that this is exactly what is going to happen, and I guarantee it, because God says, Allah wipes clean what he wants and he establishes and he has the mother of all books. judgment, everything is finished, hell and heaven, Allah will show his face to the believers. Is that true? Well, and it's an interpretation of the verse of the Quran. Wujuhun yawma idin nadira ila rabbiha nadira. The faces on that day will be wholesome and glowing, and they will be looking at their Lord. Now, you can't see Allah as Allah, yes? But Allah may give a vision to the heart of his own existence. As far as the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt are concerned, they interpret it as Wujuhun Yawmaidin Nadira ila Rahmati Rabbiha Nadira. And they will be looking at the Rahma of their God. So as Imam Ali said in one of his khutbah, that I do not worship a God that I do not see. So they said. Do you see God? He said, not with the eyes, but with the heart. So the Quran is open to many interpretations. So you can't see God as a face and ears and nose and eyes in that way, because that's not God. There is nothing like him. He is the first, the last, the apparent, the hidden. You can't see him in a little face, right? In that way. So it has to be understood as the vision of the heart, even if we have a direct interpretation of that verse. Any other questions? But our Sunni brothers certainly do have... Uh, there is a hadith that God will be seen sitting on his arsh uh, and will be like a very small sort of a, a thing that they will see. But I'm sure even if they look into their texts properly, it will, doesn't mean face and hands and feet and you know, a little man sitting there. I'm sure they will all understand as well. It doesn't mean that. It will probably mean a point of focus where his power is located or something like that. Yeah? And by the way, day of Kiyama, not everything finishes, yes? The, we don't know. The broader cosmos might still be functioning. It will be Kiyama for us. And we need to interpret Kiyama as well. The Quran talks about several different levels of Qiyama. Yeah? Anyone else? Yeah. Um, so, uh, what is the meaning of impersonal God? So impersonal God is one that cannot be approached, that does not involve himself in human affairs. Yeah? 
He has created us. Obviously, he is the overwhelming, but he's not evolving himself. Now, that does not mean he doesn't govern anything. He does govern. But it means that we have no personal recourse to him. But the theory of Lord, my Lord, is the face of God, or is the face of Allah, or is the aspect of Allah, altering the human being and relating to human being as a collective body as we explained with anger and pleasure an enemy of God and friend of God and at the same time he relates to the individual at a very ulti intimate level Allah waliyulladheena amanu he is the wali of those who believe ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna irja'i ila rabbiki O contented soul return to your Lord so he very personally belongs to the individual as well yeah. So that's known as a personal God. <clears throat> yes, uh, cousin. You see, COVID is not novel in the way of being a virus. There have been many viruses before this day as well that have killed hundreds of millions of people. Yeah? Now the world population is greater than it's been in its history. And far fewer people have suffered at the hands of COVID. Sometimes what we need to understand is that there are natural processes and natural dynamics within the worldly, earthly existence. We are bodies. We are evolving. We will encounter, because we are also experimenting with nature. We are creating viruses. We are manipulating nature. At times, it gives production. It, 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 it gives way to certain things that don't really fit in, but then they adjust themselves. The earth, the world, is a knowing being, conscious. It readjusts itself, it rebalances itself. So we are on our evolutionary journey. In that evolutionary journey, we are experimenting as is our inner nature. Because we want to reach out to be God. We want to become God-like. We want to become God, right? In the world of the mind. We want to explore, we want to have control. It gives rise to all these things. So they are natural part of the existence of the earth. They are nothing to do with righteousness claims or claims of not being right. For example, during the COVID people were saying, oh, it's a sign of the 12th Imam coming because Hajj will be abandoned this year. Well, no, Hajj has been abandoned for 10 years previously during another pandemic or, 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 or a plague that was local to that area or a global. It's these things have forever happened. They're normal parts of human life. They have nothing to do with righteousness of one religion or wrongfulness of another religion. The beautiful example the Quran gives is when people with the Blessed Prophet went to Ohad and they lost their battle, they were baffled, the Muslim community. Because they felt that if they accept and embrace Islam, then they become invincible. Because they are godly people now. They lost. And the response Quran gave is still kalayam nudawiluha nas. These are the normal workings of the earth and human society and the dynamics that are there. Yesterday was victory for you at Badr, today is loss for you. Yeah, that's the way life is. The central point is how do you as an individual and as a community through victory and defeat find your purpose and find your God. And the inevitable end, the, sorry, the ultimate end from the human existence is that through this warring we learn to come to a state of maturity where we can diffuse tension through good diplomacy. Through COVID, instead of hoarding and saying, I'm going to have enough sustenance for myself to say, no, I will go hungry, but I'll feed my neighbor. These are the human virtues that are to be learned through these events and they're quite good in that way and they are a reflection of God's mercy upon humanity that humanity comes to the brilliance of its godliness through these challenges and then we at the same time challenge our fanciful theologies you know and now all the theologies are out 
COVID shut the pub, the casino, and the mosque. <laughs> there you go. It's the most universal of all things. It doesn't spare one or the other. So we have to understand beyond the casino and the mosque is a beautiful reality. Yeah? By the way, I'll remind you of uh, something that I wrote that enraged many people. Not enraged, it, 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 it's prompted many minds that the virus has finally freed God from the mosque or the places of worship and placed him on his rightful throne, the hearts of people. Freeing God from the mosque is the greatest blessing. He is not in the mosque. He is here. That's the throne. Find him here. The mosque is just a reflection.